Today we're going to look at part of what I'll call the ladder of continuity. And this is going to involve some notions that you would learn in a basic real analysis class, as well as some examples based around those ideas. Okay, so let's look at the following three definitions, which are three types of continuity, if you want to think about it like that. So the first is so-called Lipschitz continuity, which will just say that F is Lipschitz if it's Lipschitz continuous. Okay, so we'll say F is Lipschitz on a subset A of the real numbers. If we can find a positive number M so that the absolute value of F of X minus F of Y is less than or equal to M times the absolute value of X minus Y. And that's going to hold for all X and Y in A. Next up, we'll say that F is uniformly continuous. That's the next level down of continuity. And it'll be called uniformly continuous on our set A if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there's a delta bigger than zero. So that for any X, Y, and A that are close enough together with their within delta of each other, we have absolute value of F of X minus F of Y less than epsilon. And observe that this delta was brought into existence before we decided what X and Y are. So it's independent of X and Y. Next up, we'll say that F is just regular continuous or continuous on our subset A if for all epsilon bigger than zero and X in A, we can find a delta bigger than zero so that for all y that's within delta of x, we have absolute value of f of x minus f of y less than epsilon. Now observe here, the delta was brought into existence after we talked about our point x. That means that delta could depend on x. And that's what differs in continuity versus uniform continuity. So let's start the video by proving the following very classic set of results. So if F is Lipschitz, then it's uniformly continuous. And then we'll also show that if F is uniformly continuous, then it's continuous. Okay, so let's start by supposing that F is Lipschitz at A. Okay, but what does that tell us? That tells us that there exists a positive number M such that the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to m times the absolute value of x minus y. And this is going to hold for all x and y inside of a, our, whatever our domain is. Okay, but now let's say we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take our delta in this case to be equal to epsilon over m. And we'll also suppose that the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta. And now the following calculation will finish this off. So let's notice that if we look at the absolute value of f of x minus f of y, that'll be less than or equal to m times the absolute value of x minus y by our Lipschitz condition. But now that is going to be strictly less than m times delta, just by our assumption that x minus y is less than delta. But then notice that delta is epsilon over m, so m times delta is equal to epsilon. So seeing this inequality here given by the blue underline is exactly what we need for uniform continuity. Notice our delta did not depend on x, the point that we were at. Okay. So now let's see what we can do for the red dot, showing that if F is uniformly continuous, then it is continuous. This is actually super clear because all we have to do is take whatever delta is associated to the uniform continuity and use that same delta here. And notice that this delta works for all X and Y in A. So since it works for all X and Y and A, it works for this fixed X that we fixed before the existence of the delta over here. So I'm not actually going to work through that. I'll just put that this is clear by our verbal discussion. 
Now, I guess maybe one of the most logical questions to ask after we see a result like this is, is the converse true? And in fact, the converse of each of these statements is false. And well, let's see examples that show that. Okay, so first we'll find an example of a function that's continuous but not uniformly continuous. And in fact, we're gonna use this very simple function f of x equals x squared. So let's start by showing it's continuous. But we need a bit of a scratch calculation in order to do that. That uh, really motivates our proof. Okay, so notice that what we want is for x squared minus y squared to be less than epsilon. But that's the same thing as the absolute value of f x minus y times the absolute value of x plus y less than epsilon. Now, if we had our delta equal to one, then y minus x would be between negative one and positive one. If absolute value of x minus y was less than delta, as would be like our assumption over here built into continuity. But now let's observe that that means that x plus y is between 2x minus 1 and 2x plus 1. But from there, it pretty quickly follows that the absolute value of x plus y is less than 2 times the absolute value of x plus 1, where we've used the triangle inequality, you know, while we make that calculation. And the fact that x plus y exists right here, that gives us the motivation to choose our delta to be epsilon over this 2 times the absolute value of x plus 1. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's say we are given our epsilon bigger than 0, and our point x, which in this case we'll take to be the real numbers because our function is continuous over all real numbers. And now let's set our delta equal to the minimum of one and this number epsilon over two times the absolute value of x plus one. So that bled into the box, but I think that's okay. And now let's also suppose that the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta. Notice that that implies that the absolute value of x minus y is less than one because delta is less than or equal to one by the way that we wrote delta or defined delta. But now from this inequality right here, that implies that the absolute value of x plus y is less than two times the absolute value of x plus one just repeating our calculation over here that we did in our scratch work. And then from this setup, we're ready to do our final calculation. So let's notice that the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is equal to the absolute value of x squared minus y squared, which is the absolute value of x minus y times the absolute value of x plus y. But now we have bounds for each of those things. So this is less than delta times two times the absolute value of x plus one by the two bounds that we have. But delta is less than or equal to epsilon over that two times the absolute value of x plus one, meaning this whole thing is less than or equal to epsilon. But now reading from here through this inequality is exactly what we need for continuity. Okay, so now let's show it's not uniformly continuous. So to show that this is not uniformly continuous, let's negate the definition of uniformly continuous. That'll give us a definition of not uniformly continuous. And then we'll show that our function satisfies that new negated definition. So let's recall that for all statements will be exchanged with their exist statements. And then we'll pick up negatives as, as well. So notice that this for all epsilon bigger than zero will translate to a there exists epsilon bigger than zero. The there exists delta bigger than zero will translate to for all delta bigger than zero. The for all x, y in A will translate to a there exists x, y in A. And then this implication statement will turn into the following. 
So I'll write it as we have absolute value of x minus y less than delta, but the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is bigger than or equal to epsilon. So that's our negated definition. So since we've got a there exists epsilon here, we can just find some nice number to set epsilon equal to and make this all work. Okay, so let's take epsilon equal to the number one, and then let's say that we are given some delta bigger than zero, because this has to hold for all delta bigger than zero. Now we wanna construct an x and a y that makes this stuff happen. And I should say that this a here, well, well, it'll be the real numbers in our case. Okay, so what should our x and y be? So let's set x equal to one plus one over delta, and we'll set y equal to x plus delta over two. And now let's see what we get out of that. So observe that the absolute value of x minus y, well, that's most definitely equal to delta over two, which is less than delta, just based of our, off of our construction right there. But let's observe that if we do the absolute value of f of x minus f of y, we'll get the absolute value of x minus y times the absolute value of x plus y. You know, I did that factoring. Okay. But now absolute value of x minus y is equal to delta over two. Oh, that's just simply by the calculation that we did right there. And then the absolute value of x plus y, well, that's gonna be equal to two plus two over delta plus delta over two. I think that's pretty clear. Now let's observe that that is greater than delta over two times two over delta. And that's simply because from that inequality, we just left off two things that are obviously positive. Okay, but notice delta over two times two over delta is equal to one. So observe that we have absolute value of f of x minus f of y is bigger than one. But with all of this setup right here, we have seen that our function f of x equals x squared satisfies this definition for things not being uniformly continuous. So that means that this function is continuous, but not uniformly so. Okay, so now let's prove the other converse is also not true. That is, we can find a uniformly continuous function that is not Lipschitz. For our example of a uniformly continuous function that is not Lipschitz, we'll take f of x equals the square root of x. We'll start by proving that it is uniformly continuous. Okay, so let's say we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take delta in this case to be epsilon squared. And then also suppose that we have x and y on the interval from zero to infinity, such that the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta. So in other words, we've got our setup for uniform continuity on, well, the domain of the square root function. Now let's make our calculation. So we've got absolute value of f of x minus f of y is equal to the absolute value of radical x minus radical y, but observe that that's equal to the square root of the absolute value of the square root of x minus the square root of y times itself. So square root of x minus square root of y. So there we simply squared something and took the square root. But now what we're gonna do is build that into an inequality. And I'm gonna do that by replacing this minus sign with a plus sign. But that makes this whole thing bigger, so I need to replace this equal sign with a uh, greater than or a less than or equal to sign, depending on which side you're reading it from. Okay, but now what we can do, well now we can just multiply that stuff out and we'll see that we get the square root of the absolute value of x minus y. Oh, but now that in turn is gonna be less than the square root of delta, which is equal to the square root of epsilon squared, which is equal to epsilon. 
So again, starting here and working through this whole inequality shows that this is in fact uniformly continuous. Now let's show it's not Lipschitz. Now we'll show that our function is not Lipschitz, but we'll do that by negating the definition for a function to be Lipschitz, building a definition for the function not to be Lipschitz or to be not Lipschitz. Okay, so let's see how we can negate this definition. This one is a little bit easier to negate than our uniform continuity uh, definition. Okay, so again, uh, for all statements turn into there exist st statements and vice versa. So observe that we've got a there exists statement right here. There is m bigger than zero. So that means what we need is a for all m bigger than zero. And then here we've got a for all x and y in a. So that's going to change into a there exists x and y in a. And then, well, this inequality is going to get negated. So that'll turn into something like this. We have absolute value of f of x minus f of y is in fact strictly bigger than m times the absolute value of x minus y. So there, now we've got a definition for something to be not Lipschitz. So again, we're working with our function, the square root function. So let's see how we can do this. So let's say we are given our number m, which is bigger than zero. Let's take x to be equal to one over four times m squared, and we'll take y to be equal to zero. And now let's observe that if we take the absolute value of f of x minus f of y, we simply get the, we simply get the square root of one over four times m squared but that's gonna be equal to one over two times m. But now here's where the trick comes in. We're gonna write that one over two times m as two times m times one over four m squared. But then that one over four times m squared is exactly x minus y. So this is equal to two times m times the absolute value of x minus y Oh, but two times m is bigger than one times m, so this is strictly bigger than m times x minus y. But that's exactly what we needed to satisfy this definition of something not being Lipschitz. And that's a good place to stop.